um, Professor Ramakont's uh, lecture. So again, for those of you who are joining us, welcome. Um, I'm George Zubelli and uh, I'm chairing this session today and uh, I'm co-organizing this with uh, uh, IMPA, uh, IMPA's um, uh, group and with uh, Bruno Dupier and uh, Marco Vejaneda. And uh, we, I'd like to, we'd like to acknowledge the support from Diamond uh, Investments. And uh, we also would like to mention that this is a joint uh, uh, meeting organized by IMPA and uh, by Halifa University. So without further ado, let's move on to Professor Rama Kont. Rama, would you be able to please um, uh, share your, or present your slides? Can you see it now? We are getting there. Yes, I can see that. And uh, so, so Professor Ramakont is going to talk about excursion risk, a novel approach to the analysis of dynamic trading strategies. And uh, Professor, so can you, yes, can you see the slide? Yes, 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 okay. it's there, Rama. Okay, and uh, please okay. make sure that you turn off your your YouTube. It's even better now. Okay, is it? Uh... Uh, can you see the full screen now? Yes. Okay. It's, yes. Okay, great. So, so Professor Ramakont is a world-renowned uh, specialist in many areas of finance, and it's really an honor to have him uh, today. Uh, he's uh, from the Mathematical Institute at the University of Oxford right now. And uh, Rama, thank you very much for taking the time to share with us your uh, ideas. Thank you very much, George. Uh, it's a pleasure to present here. I had the pleasure of going to Rio uh, many times for this conference organized by George, Bruno, and Marco. But uh, when George told me that this year it's dedicated to Marco's uh, birthday, I was especially pleased to accept to give this talk because I've been collaborating with Marco for many years and uh, I've learned a lot from him. And so it's a great pleasure to present this work uh, in, in honor of Marco's birthday. I don't know if he's here or somewhere online. but uh, OK, so uh, happy birthday, Marco. OK, so this is joint work with uh, Anna Ananova and Jean Yuan Xu, my colleagues in Oxford. And it, the title is a bit uh, intriguing, excursion risk. I'm going to explain what it is. It's basically what we think is a novel approach to the analysis of dynamic trading strategies uh, that is based on a very beautiful chapter of uh, probability theory called excursion theory. So for those who are familiar with it, they will immediately understand after the first few slides why there's this connection. For the others, I will give a brief introduction to excursion theory as we go on. So uh, here's an outline. I will discuss a little bit what kind of trading strategies I, I'm, I'm uh, thinking about. And then we'll introduce the notion of excursion and what we call delta excursions and show how it's very useful for the analysis of dynamic trading strategies. And then we will describe uh, some analytical results in the case where uh, we have Markovian processes. OK, so what are we talking about? So many trading strategies um, are built on the assumption that some price of a portfolio or reference asset will eventually revert to a target value over a certain time horizon. Okay, so uh, uh, so then you can think of this, so basically you have a way to forecast uh, the behavior of a price, and if you think you're able to for forecast this, you call the forecast AT, if the current price is PT, then you think that the difference will eventually go to zero. So we can call this difference a trading signal because the position of this trading signal with respect to zero will tell you whether you should buy or sell the corresponding portfolio. So if you, if you define a trading signal as a difference between the market price and the target, then basically if this difference is negative enough, it's a buying opportunity, where, while if it's positive enough, it's a selling opportunity or a shorting opportunity. There are many strategies which can be formulated in this way. Well, the simplest one is a value trade. You have an analyst or some, uh, some uh, 
expert in markets who forecast that, you know, tells you that the correct value for such and such stock is this. Uh, I think this stock is worth 150, currently it's 100, so it's undervalued. So that means I forecast that it's going to go up. That's a simple example. It's a non, non mathematical for, for forecast based on value analysis. There are statistical versions of this, like pairs trading. You, you look at the difference between two stocks, a spread, and then you uh, try to uh, model it as a stationary process. You estimate the stationary mean by a moving average, for example, and then you assume that the, the spread will revert to the stationary mean. So that's another example. More elaborate examples with more than two assets were discussed in a very interesting paper by Avigenede and Lee in, in 2010, which is very well known to quants. It's a paper which tried to uh, formalize, uh, give a framework to study uh, various types of statistical ar arbitrage strategies uh, uh, that uh, is based on the notion of, uh, of principal component analysis. So instead of just looking at pairs, you can try to identify combinations of assets which are, have a, a stationary behavior and then try to use that to to trade on those portfolios of assets so it's a it's a pca approach to st statistical arbitrage and there have been other approaches based on co-integration i think in particular the works by, by carol alexander so uh and so these are just examples of strategies where you identify some stationary uh, portfolio try to estimate its mean, and then you assume that this portfolio will revert to the mean. So you have a signal, which is the difference between the forecast and the uh, the current price. And so if there are transaction costs in your problem, a tiny deviation from the forecast is not going to be worth trading on. You have some uh, threshold delta. If the threshold ex If the signal exceeds the threshold, that's when you trade. And in fact, this uh, thing about uh, trading when some signal exceeds the threshold is not specific to statistical arbitrary. For example, if you look at delta hedging of options, again, in presence of tran transaction cost, you uh, have a signal, which is the delta of the option, and you trade. Uh, it tells you to trade when this signal deviates uh, from zero by some threshold delta, which corresponds to uh, something related to the transaction cost. OK. Now, if you have a strategy like this, and we'll see that there are a lot of examples of strategies of this type, it, trades occur when the signal crosses a threshold. So you trade at some hitting time of some levels by a process. You do not trade at a fixed grid uh, periodically or things like that, as, as it happens in discrete time models. That doesn't happen. That's not a realistic strategy. Nobody trades every day at 2 p.m. Uh, necessarily. They only trade when they think that there's an opportunity for profit. And so in these strategies, this opportunity for profit is when a signal hits a threshold. Okay. Well, how can you define this? Well, you take your signal S and then you define certain level of crossing time. So if it's delta, well, it's, uh, it's basically uh, you define successive times where the signal goes through delta and then back to zero, then go to delta and back back to zero. So we can define them in this way. So tau i plus is the first time after theta i minus one where the signal crosses delta, and theta i is the first time after tau i when s goes back to zero. And so you define these level crossing times, and you can see it in the picture. It's very simple. Uh, at some point, you cross zero, and then you wait until you cross delta, and then this defines the, the, the time tau i, and then you wait on the next time after this when you cross zero and so on. So you can chop up your signal into blue and red pieces. The blue pieces are the uh, ascent from zero to delta, and the red piece is the descent from delta to zero. And for example, one strategy will be, well, uh, during the blue phase, do nothing. And then uh, when you hit uh, a delta, you short the portfolio. And then you wait until you hit zero. And then you unwind the portfolio. So every time you do this, every, ci every cycle, you will make a profit of delta. OK, so this is one a one-sided strategy. And of course, uh, so what, what is happening here, well, you define a sequence of hitting times. In between uh, uh, the theta i and and tau i, uh, sorry, in between tau i and theta, uh, tau, tau i minus one and theta i, you do nothing, and, and between theta i and tau i, you short the stock. So each each cycle is uh, 
uh, cut into two uh, periods, a waiting period and then the holding period where you hold the stock. And this strategy, simple strategy, generates a profit of delta over each cycle. It's the distance uh, that the price tra travels. And uh, during the holding period, you have a mark to the market value, which is the move uh, the, by the price since the, your transaction. So the profit can be cut into uh, the realized pro profit, so delta times the number of trades plus whatever loss has occurred since your last trade. Okay, so you can see immediately that for a strategy like this, the profit loss is linked to, well, the, the duration and frequency of these excursions from zero to delta and back to zero. Okay, now there's nothing special about this example. You can do the same thing for downward excursions. So you wait until the uh, price goes down uh, uh, below the forecast by minus delta, and then you buy, and then you wait till it comes back. So again, if you do this, you make a profit of delta every time you go from zero to delta back to zero. And um, you can define but similarly these level crossing times. This time I put a minus to do the downward excursion. So it's really symmetric of the other one for, with a minus. Okay. And with these two building blocks, uh, F5 plus and 5 minus, you can construct more complex strategies. So these were one-sided trading strategies, and you can build a two-sided one just by summing them. They're, they correspond to disjoint events. So this is called uh, usually a convergence trade. So you, you, if the price goes away from a target, either from up or down, either should go long or short, and then I wait till it comes back. That's called a convergence trade. And uh, you can put exposure limits, stop limits, a stop losses, for example, if I put a stop loss, at, I say if I lose more than M, I cut my position, then it means that I put a third uh, level crossing, which I call uh, kappa, which is the first time after uh, the, the transaction time where the price goes away by more than M from the level. Well, that means I lose money if I go too far away from the level, and then, then I cut my loss at M. Okay? So then you have, a, again, a similar type of expression with now a new stopping time, which is the infimum of two other stopping times. Okay, so you can see that um, you can build more and more complex strategies, and uh, they will always be expressed in terms of level costing times of some reference uh, of the price, of the signal. And they, the profit loss of these strategies is linked to the frequency, duration, and the amplitude of these excursions away from zero which can reach levels uh, plus or minus delta, plus or minus delta, plus M and so on. Okay, so, so that's why we're interested in excursions because if you know everything about these excursions, uh, what, I, what I claim is that you know everything about the profit and loss and risk of this strategy, this, these types of strategies. And this class includes many, many important classes of trade strategy. So what are these excursions? Let's define them properly. Well, as you saw, each trading cycle corresponds to a path which goes uh, away from zero, reaches a certain level, which we call delta, and then comes back to zero. So we're going to call these things excursions. So let me define a notation for a, a fun function starting from zero. I'm going to call Tx of f the first hitting time of the level x. So I'm going to use this notation many times. And we're going to call an excursion from zero to delta a path which starts from zero, reaches some level delta in a finite time, and then stops when it reaches delta. I'm going to stop it at, at delta. So this is the set of excursions, path which start from zero, they reach delta in a finite time, and then afterwards I set them equal to delta. I cut them. And what we're going to do is we're going to cut our price path or signal into such excursions. I'm going to slice it at... Uh, uh, into a, different excursions from one le level to another. And then I'm going to paste them back. I'm going to slice the path. I'm going to paste these pieces back to get back the path. And this pasting back is called concatenation. So a concatenation at point T of two paths U and V will be, well, I just take the two paths and paste them at uh, time T. The second path V, I'm, I'm going to translate it to start from uh, the pasting point capital T. So this is the operation that you see here is the intuitive uh, the notion of concatenation of two paths. So if I have an excursion from zero to A and an excursion from A to zero, if I paste them together at the point where the first one hits A, then I have an excursion from zero to zero. Okay. So 
that's what we're going to call a delta excursion. So a delta excursion is an excursion from zero to delta, followed by a second excursion from delta to zero. So at the end, you go back to zero, but you have gone through a level delta, which is the level, in our case, which triggers a transaction. Okay, so uh, we call this set U delta. So U delta is a set of excursions from a delta excursion. So a delta excursion is simply an excursion from zero to delta, followed by an excursion from delta back to zero, and I paste them together at the first hitting time of delta by uh, the, the first part. Okay, so it's easy to show that this decomposition is unique. If you have a delta excursion, there's a unique decomposition into an excursion from zero to delta, delta to zero, and uh, you, we, uh, each one has a has a duration. If you take a sum of the two durations, we call it the duration of the delta excursion. Um, note that so. So this is an example of delta excursion. So here, let's call, uh, let's use delta equals one as, as an example. I start from zero, and then I go up and down, up and down, up and down, and then at some point I hit one. Okay, I reach one, and that's the first part of my delta excursion. It's um, the U, what I call U. And it's an excursion from zero to delta, and then. I go back from delta to zero. I may go up first and then down, and, and eventually I reach zero, then I stop. So this is an example of a delta excursion. So you can see that I can, uh, in the first part, I can uh, go back to zero infinitely many, many times, uh, in this case, many, many times in this picture. That's okay. As long as I don't hit delta, I haven't achieved the first part. But uh, once I reach delta, then uh, I can only go back to zero once because then I stop, okay? So it means that um, if I go backwards from the end, uh, there is something that we can call the last excursion from zero to, to zero inside this delta excursion. So there is a unique last excursion, which uh, we, we may use later in, to prove some, some results. Okay, this is called the last exit decomposition of a delta excursion. Okay, so you say, okay, why do we care about this? Well, because if you follow the, what the strategies I presented er earlier, uh, if you look at the profit loss, risk, any quantity involving these strategies, they have a nice decomposition in terms of delta excursions. And that's what I'm gonna show now. So first of all, these delta excursions are not um, restricted. They're building blocks which can be used to construct any path. And in fact, you can use them to construct any discontinuous path, but here I will give you statements about continuous paths because it, the notation is a bit simpler. So if you take any con continuous function on the half line, then uh, the statement is that, well, you do define these level crossing times as we just did, tau i and theta i, and you can use them to slice up your path in a unique way into, well, guess what? Excursions from zero to delta followed by excursions from delta to zero. So any path has a unique decomposition into delta excursions and the decomposition is simply given by these level crossing times that we defined earlier. If we uh, take these level cross crossing times, they give you the decomposition. So it's very simple really. Now, why is it interesting? Well, because once I have this decomposition, I will show you that we get very simple expressions for lots of quantities which we want to compute for these train strategies. All the quantities we would like to compute in a risk a monitoring uh, framework. And these are path dependent quant quant quantities. In general, they're not easy to compute for stochastic process. But if I give you the decomposition into delta expressions, then they're trivial to compute. In fact, here it is. So if I have a path and decompose it into delta excursions, then, well, from this decomposition, I can cal calculate very easily using a finite number of algebraic operations, the gain of the portfolio, okay, here's the expression, the worst case, the worst loss during zero T, what's my worst loss? And uh, so this can be a, a, um, a way to co compute the margin requirements, for example, if this is a derivatives portfolio or this is an exchange account. I can also compute the drawdown, which is a quantity which is used to monitor the performance of funds and so on. So all these are path dependent quantities, but once I have the delta excursion decomposition, they are very simple, simple to compute using elementary operations. Okay, 
So this shows that this delta excursion notion has some interesting properties. Uh, and here's an example. Again, I'm not going to go into this. But uh, the important thing is that these quantities, as I showed you, involve independent calculations on delta excursion. So you give me the decomposition of S into delta excursion. Then I do calculations on each piece independently. So OK. Now, um, how do we, um, how do we uh, take a path and decompose it into these delta excursions or into excursions but more generally? Well, um, so but the idea is, so, I mean, this has been studied in the theory of stochastic processes for other reasons. So this was done first by Ito in the 70s. So he looked at, he, he studied excursions of stochastic processes from, uh, and he noticed that, okay, well, one, um, if you have a, a path which crosses, for example, the level zero finite number of times, well, then counting the excursions is very easy. You just count how, how many times you cross zero, and then you label the excursions, first excursion from zero to zero, second excursion, so on. So that's easy. But if, if you look at a path like Brownian motion or some diffusion, that might not be possible because uh, uh, something like Brownian motion can cross a level like zero infinitely many times. So you can't really count uh, in this ordered way the excursion from zero to zero. So Ito understood that the correct way to do this, to label these excursions, is to use the notion of local time. So what is the notion of local time? Well, the local time is defined in the following way. You look at the time spent by the path in a set A, that's the occupation the measure. And if this measure has a density with respect to the Lebesgue measure, it's called the local time of the path. And we're interested in the local time at zero, so the value of this density at, at zero. So you can th think of it as a process which increases every time the path crosses zero. So it increases on the set of times where you cross zero. And that's going, going to be a, a way of counting the excursions, except that now you don't count it with integers. You count it with this in increasing process, which is uh, a real value then increasing. Okay. So think of this as a label for count counting how many times you cross the zero. And now uh, we introduce the inverse local time at zero. So the inverse local time says, well, um, how much time t do I have to wait to cross the level zero a certain number of times? And this is the how much time t I have to wait so that the local time at zero exceeds some level l. So that's tau l. So this is called the inverse local time is zero. So it translates the local time into normal time, chronological time. OK, so we're going to switch between normal time uh, and, lo and local time. And the way we switch is to this inverse local time. This is just the inverse of the increasing fu function that is the local time. OK, so why all this fuss? Because as Ito clearly showed, this is the correct way to label excursions from zero to, to zero when the path is irregular because the path can cross zero infinitely many times. So you take a path S, which has local time LTS at zero. We call tau the inverse local time. So this uh, counts how much time you need to uh, uh, for the local time to exceed L. And then you say, well, you know what? Uh, along these excursions away from zero, the local time is constant because the local time only increases when I cross zero. So if I'm in, on an excursion which is away, from, uh, going away from zero, along this excursion, the local time does not increase, so it's constant. And it only increases when I hit back the zero. So it means that I can label each of these excursions by the value of the local time at a starting point, and that's how we label them. So Ito said, well, you take a path S, and now we can label the excursions uh, by this label L, which is the value of the local time at the beginning of the excursion. And the excursion labeled L, what is it? Well, it's just a piece of S which starts at some point and ends uh, when at the next hitting time of zero. What is the point at which it starts? Well, it's the uh, inverse local time right before I reach L. So it's tau L minus. So I'm not going to go into this, but this is basically uh, it's it's just the translation of the de definition of local time. Okay, so given a path, you can slice it into excursions from zero to, to zero. Each slice has a unique label, which is the local time, 
and then uh, the, each slice looks like this. It's just, just a slice of S. And there can be infinitely many slices, but we're going to deal with that. OK, so this looks like, uh, and, and now I can take these slices. So each slice is an excursion from 0 to 0. It's, it's a path. And I can count, for example, how many slices of a certain type I have. So if I have, if I take a set of paths gamma, which is a, a set of paths starting from zero, I can count up to local time L how many slices of type gamma I have. And this is a, a, uh, an example of a counting process. Okay. So um, let me. Uh, let me now describe. So, okay. So, what you you slice them in, into these excursions, but why are, why is that interesting? I have one path, and now you tell me I have to deal with infinitely many paths. Is that is that really simpler? Well, yes. If your path S is a Markov process, okay. So Ito noted that if you have a if your signal S is a Markov process, then well, you have the strong Markov property of S, which tell, tells you that a Markov process starts anew every time it hits zero. It starts with the same law. Okay, so it means that if you slice your path into these excursions from zero to zero, these slices are independent paths with the same law. Why? Because every time you start a Markov process from the same point a homogeneous Markov process, you have exactly the same law. It forgets everything that happened before. So every time you hit zero, you start anew. You have a new life. And everything is for, forgiven and forgotten. And so you have uh, infinitely many uh, independent paths, all starting from the same point. Now, that's very nice, because you can start from a Markov process which has non-independent increments, very complicated structures, a diffusion, non-linear process, a local volatility model, whatever you like. As long as it's a Markov process, every time it hits zero, it starts life from anew and independently from what happened in the past. So that's really great because it means that we're going to slice our path into independent IID pieces, in fact. Therefore, we're going to uh, be able to compute all the quantities we're interested in as a sum over IID ob objects. And that's really very simple in general to compute or simulate. So that's what we're going to do. OK, so we start from a Markov process S, and then we uh, slice it as the Ito into excursions from 0 to 0. So Ito defines what he calls the excursion process of S, as well as the collection of excursions indexed by local time. And he noted that these excursions are independent random variables, but with values in some space of paths. So it's an infinite di dimensional space, but it's an IID family. Okay. I'm not saying ID sequence because it's not indexed by a, an integer. It's an IID family. OK, now this seems complicated, but we're going to see that it's very powerful. And it leads to uh, same simplification of a lot of things, especially for the problem we started from. Now, the major result of Ito was to show that not only we can slice it into these independent pieces, but these independent pieces, these excursions indexed by the local time, they are, in fact, a Poisson point process. So we start from any Markov process S. No other assumption that it's a Markov process with some standard regularity assumptions. Then you can show that this excursion process, the set of excursions indexed by the, the, the local time is, in fact, a Poisson point process. So what does Poisson point process mean? It means that, well, if I take two uh, a, a set, any set, but the gamma of paths, I say, well, I want to count the number of excursions which fall into this set gamma or of type gamma. Well, this is going, going to be a Poisson, a, a Poisson process with some intensity, OK, that we call nu of gamma. And if I take two, two disjoint sets, so two, for example, uh, excursions whose maximum exceeds, uh, uh, it falls between m1 and m2, and then eight excursions whose maximum exceeds m2, so these are disjoint sets, then I get two independent Poisson processes. So that's really handy, because it gives us a lot of things to compute with uh, when we are interested in properties of excursions. 
So this picture shows a little bit what Ito was uh, doing. I mean, he really thought of a Markov process as you choose a point in this picture is Ito's hand. And you think of a Markov process as a succession, in fact, an infinite succession of independent upward and downward excursions going through this point. So this is may, may, maybe a, a natural way of seeing a Markov process, but that's exactly what excursion theory does. And what Ito shows is that this is a very powerful way to de decompose a process. Now, what we're so so this is this uh, fact that these excursions are described by Poisson point process is very powerful because a Poisson point process is fully described by what's called the intensity. So if I know the intensity of these of these Poisson processes, so it's a measure new on the space of excursions. Every time I take a set the gamma, the number of excursions in gamma is described by a Poisson process with intensity new of gamma. So if I know this measure new, I know everything about the excursions. So this Rama, question is, please, yes, uh, how three much minutes more, three minutes more, please. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, the question is, how do we describe this excursion measure new? Well. There are many ways to describe it. I'm not going to go into it here, but one useful way for us is to slice the space into excursions with a given maximum and then describe the distribution of this maximum. So you disintegrate this, this measure with respect to the distribution of the maximum. And we'll see that a lot of the quantities we described earlier, loss cal calculations, risk calculations, drawdown calculations, only depend on the maximum of the excursion. So you can integrate over the second part. So let, let me then show you how this, how this theory applies to what the problem we started from. Well, well, what we're interested in are delta excursions, so excursions which go through delta and then go back, back to zero. So uh, using Ito's theory, one can show that, well, the number of delta excursions up to local time L is indeed a Poisson process. This is a direct application of the of Ito's theorem, but, but if we go back to real time, not local time, in chronological time, the number of delta excursions up to time t is what we call a renewal process, so a process with IID uh, intervals, inter-arrival times, and we can describe uh, a, a exactly the distribution of these inter-arrival times, the durations of these delta excursions in terms of Ito's excursion measure through the formula shown here. So this means that the the delta excursions will have independent durations, and you can compute them uh, from the Ito's, uh, the Ito's description. So this means that any Markov process, you can have a independent uh, decomposition into IID delta excursion. So the, 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 the decomposition I showed you earlier for a path, if you apply to a Markov process, the pieces are now IID. So they're completely described by some distribution on the space of excursion. That's a distribution of delta excursion. So if I know this, then I can describe all the quantities that I'm, in, that I'm interested in for these strategies. So but do we know this for some examples? Well, yes. So what we show in the paper is that actually all these quantities are analytically computable in the case of a diffusion process. So if you have a one-dimensional diffusion process with our arbitrary the generator with coefficients described here in full generality, then you can compute all these things and you can compute in particular the distribution of holding and waiting periods, distribution of length of the delta excursions, expected number of trades, maximum loss per trade cycle, stop loss probabilities, distribution of realized profits, everything can be done analytically without directly knowing the, the, the the generator, you can describe them through these quantities, which are global quantities, the speed and scale measure. One interesting example, so interesting examples are, uh, of course, Brownian and Boshan, uh, also the orstein ullenbeck process, because in these statistical arbitrary strategies, that's um, the majority of pa papers in this literature use the orstein ullenbeck as a as a, as a model for the signal. So I skip this, we can get uh, close form expressions for this. But what I want to show is this. Um, if you apply, for example, the OU model, which is the mo most widely used model in applications in statistical arbitrage, to examples, here we use a pairs trading example, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola as a pair. And you, so you estimate the, um, uh, the, the 
parameters of Orstein-Ulenbeck on this pair, and then you compare the distributions of holding period, waiting period, maximum loss, all the things that are completely computable in this model with the data. So this is what you see. Data is blue. Uh, OU models, uh, the distributions you get from the OU model are green. This is logarithmic plots. So you can see that the prediction of the model is logarithmically wrong. That means very wrong. So what does this mean? It means the most popular model used in statistical arbitrage for pairs trading on these things is actually not a very good description, even qualitatively, for this. And here uh, uh, we'll show this on an example, but there are many other examples. That's be because it gets right the mean and the variance and correlation and so on by construction, but it gets wrong the description of the excursions. And the risk in these strategies is everything about how large and how far and how long the excursions are. It seems that it's qualitatively wrong. These, uh, these graphs are pretty bad. So how can we do better? Well, that's where, that's the last part of the talk. I want to show you that yes, now. Yes, Rama, please, yeah. one minute more. Try yeah. to wrap one up. Minute, one more. So the idea is, well, we start from this decomposition into delta excursion. We say that I don't need to know what Markov process by signal is. I just know that it's some Markov process. It's not necessarily OU. I decompose it into delta excursions empirically. Okay, I take my path, I slice it into delta excursions, and the theorem tells me that these pieces are IID variables in excursion space. So it means that now I have a sample of n excursions from this distribution of delta excursions, and now I'm going to use that sample to estimate this uh, infinite dimensional uh, distribution of delta excursions, and if I want to generate new realistic paths, what I, want, what I can do is sample from this distribution. What does it mean? It means sampling from the delta excursions that I've observed empirically and reshuffling them. So it means that I just need to generate uh, IID integers, and then I bootstrap from my delta excursions, and I build new paths by concatenating them. So this method, what we show in the paper is that this method leads to new sample paths which correctly mimic the properties of delta excursions of the original signal, but it's non-parametric. I'm not postulating any parametric model. I don't, don't need to need the, know the generator of the process, the coefficients, the SD, or whatever. It's a non-parametric thing, but because of Ito's the result, we know that these excursions are ID. Of course, the assumption is that the signal is Markov, so that's uh, gives a powerful way of doing non-parametric modeling of excursions, which we think is the correct thing to look at when you look at strategies which are sensitive to the properties of excursions rather than finite time transition probabilities. So let me show you what it gives for this Coca-Cola Tripsy Cola result. So this is an example of a path. So each red and blue piece are actual delta excursions uh, that were seen in the data, but now I'm shuffling them and pasting them in random order. So what I, what I get is a signal, which is a Markov process. I don't know what it is, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that I, I generate non-parametrically from my data. So I'll stop here and take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Rama. We ran a bit late and um, I am going to actually defer any questions unless someone comes with a question right away. Uh, I'm going to defer the questions for our chat room. Our chat room is the coffee room where everybody can say whatever they want. Um, so once again, thank you so much. This is beautiful work. I just want to comment that um, this idea of reshuffling is, is a very powerful idea, Rama, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned this. Uh, very soon we're going to have a talk uh, by Emmanuel Gobe, and I remember we did some work also on this um, kind of piecing together uh, these different samples from, from paths uh, in order to solve some um, uh, backward stochastic differential equations. So, so I'm glad that this is coming up again in this conference. So, Rama, thank you so much for your beautiful talk. And uh, let's move on to the coffee break. 
um, and at uh, half past the hour, wherever you are, uh, we are going to resume. So it's in about 20 minutes. Thanks again, Rama.